The condition is really crazy condition. And that shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Matei Yakino giving up to an elbow on his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team has just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, episode four, and you're in for a treat this week uh, because you have got a two times world champion in two different disciplines. Uh, he's going to talk about his life on the road with no other than Cowley Ciardi. Yes, he's going to talk about those world titles and how he got there. He's going to talk about uh, the videos he's been a part of and lots, lots more. It is, of course, uh, the Brazilian hotshot that is Marcelio Brown. So, Marcelio, <laughs> does anybody even call you that anymore? I, I don't yeah. record calling you that ever actually no um my close friends always called by the nickname but when i when i first meet somebody i, I kind of say my i say my real name obviously and then they call me that all right most people actually call me that okay how's the how's the how's the maui situation how's how's the covid thing go? uh maui feels by looking at the news that they got a hang of it a little bit early i think from the past couple of days, there hasn't been any new cases. And I think the whole island, we had maybe around 115 cases. So it's crazy. There is everything is closed. You you walk through Paia, which about a month ago, it was just tourists everywhere, traffic jams. Now it's all, everything is closed. They have a uh, plywood on the, on, the, on the walls. And the only things that are open is mana foods. I think Paia Fish Market is open, open for pickups, but that's pretty much it. So it's pretty guys, strict, pretty, pretty, pretty American yeah. style strict. It's it's strict. Yeah, you can go, you can go to the beach. You can still uh, go in the ocean to do what they call the accentual activities, which you can sail, or surf. But they have been kind of enforcing if there is people on the beach just sitting and not allowed to do that. A couple of days, I was people surfing and there was maybe somebody taking pictures and the police went down and, and told them to leave and, and stuff. So if, you drop in on, so, so, so if you drop in on someone and, and you don't keep your distance, it's not, it's not legal. <laughs> it's not legal. No. <laughs> yeah. So obviously you're living in Maui. If, anybody doesn't know that if somebody doesn't know that by now or didn't figure it out but you're originally from brazil born and raised in fortaleza north of brazil and your dad is a multiple brazilian champion right in windsurfing so i i don't think that was ever ever a question if you and your brother are gonna windsurf but i did hear because your dad is a racer I did hear you were actually a slalom sailor. How, how, how did that happen? And how did, you, how did you get into the waves and the freestyle, I guess, originally? I started sailing. We, we were all in front of my grandmother's apartment in, in Fortaleza, in the main town. So it was inside the harbor. So obviously flat water, light gusty winds. And, and at the time, um, my dad and my uncle for solemn sailing most of the time and then wave sailing when the conditions got really good. So the first thing I got through my parents was naturally solemn gear because it was the same thing they did. And, and I really enjoyed solemn um, when I was really young, especially recently after getting that feeling of the, of the harness and the foot strap. That's when I really liked solemn just because most of the sensation of planning and the jibes and things. And then we got into course racing soon after. But yeah, uh, <laughs> now if, even when I was that young, I, I never had uh, that competitiveness with Salom that I wanted to be faster than other people. For me, it was more I liked the sensation of Salom because you're going fast. But my dad's friends and people were kicking my ass, and it, that didn't really annoy me. So that's what I felt like, oh, maybe, I don't know if this is for me or not. And that's when freestyle came along. And then it wasn't something that I had to be competitive directly against anybody. It was more, the, the, there was new tricks every week. And I liked looking at the tricks and watching them and 
for me, visually, they were really attractive and something that I wanted to do. And not only something I wanted to do, but it was very accessible to me because I could go straight from my grandmother's. Wave sailing was hard because we needed to drive, needed more conditions. But where I grew up, freestyle was there every day. So for me, that's when, when, that, when that became available, I, that's all I wanted to do. That was my next question. Like, you're not exactly, you don't strike from the outside, at least, as a super competitive person. I know you are, but it's not like you go out to show off or to kind of kick everybody's ass to be the best guy out there or whatever. So you obviously must have realized that being a professional windsurfer, if you want to follow this path, it's going to require sort of being competitive. How, how did that come along? Because some people, they just don't, don't have it in them to, to compete, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think I, I became more competitive as I got older, probably. Um, when I was really young and I really got hooked into surfing, I don't think I ever knew what the ranking was. When I was wave sailing, I, I knew who the top guys were because I watched a lot of videos, but I never knew who was first, second, you know, third. My, my, my favorite sailors were before Kali, and those guys were Polakau and Cisco and, and, and Levi. And I came to find out that Polakau was a world champion years after in Francisco <laughs> because at that time I didn't even know. I just loved, really enjoyed watching them sail. And for me, they were the best because of how they sailed. And then once I joined the PWA, that's where I realized, oh, Francisco was world champion that year. Jason was a world champion those years. But um, for me, it was all about the visual, like how the tricks looked and the style and, and how they did what they did. That was more important. And then as I did the freestyle, naturally, the way to become a professional sailor, you had to compete. At that time, you couldn't be a so freestyle person that goes doing freestyle videos and, and make a living out of it. That, at least as far as I know, it didn't exist. So I was like, okay, you're gonna do this. This is your plan. You have to compete. So let's let's focus on competing. And it it, it was just kind of automatic, you know. But it was never a dream. Like, oh, let's compete. You know, it was never my dream. Yeah. So I guess. All you Brazilians, you kind of have this contingent going to Maui every year. And, and I guess that was kind of a natural step for you, right? When, when was the first time that, that you went to Maui? The first time I came to Maui was 2002. And I came with my uncle and maybe three more friends from Brazil. So you were like 13, is that right? No, I was, I was 12 or yeah, 12 or 13, something like that. Yeah, because I think it was right before my birthday, it was in April. I, that trip, everybody was nice to me. Like, I remember being introduced to people and I felt like everybody was friendly. And it was a nice trip to finally meet them all. Ah, for sure. I mean, you're a 13-year-old kid, probably ripping already at the time, you know? Everybody's like, if a 13-year-old kid comes up to you now, you, you're going to be stoked, you know? Genuinely. It's not like you're going to yeah. pretend or, or whatever. It's genuinely good to see, so... For sure. But it's then, nice to see so many kids now, especially in Pozo, where you see a lot of young kids and they are there, but they are not just hooking in and putting the harness and planning. They're actually going for really big moves. It's, it's nice. It's really nice to see that. Sending it, yeah. But um, and then fast forward a little bit. And as a kid, a 14-year-old kid, I guess, or 13, you, you do your first contest in Fuerte. Yeah, how was it? How was it for a kid, 13 years old, probably not necessarily knowing what to expect or, or did Kauli really prepare you well for, for what was going on? You know? um, that trip came together by full support of my parents. Uh, I was fortunate that they were able to pay for everything. They paid for my ticket and then... I spoke to Kauli before and we lined up that we stayed together. So obviously my, my parents helped me out. But then once we got there, I think I arrived in Grand Canaria the day that they were doing the finals of the wave event. And I watched the finals of, I think it was Jonas Ceballos against Vidar. And I think Vidar won or maybe the 
hard one or something, but it was a year that seat harness was Vidar. standing really good. <laughs> huh? Vidar in a seat harness, throwing doubles. Doing one-hand doubles. Doubles, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so instant. that was a, that was my first view of the Canaries. I came, Kali and Conan picked me up from the airport, and then it was obviously that traditional pozo, 50 knots or whatever, and I remember being so scared, man. I remember like sitting there and looking at the jumps and just thinking to myself, like, what am I even doing here? Like, I'm not even going to be able to break here. What a mistake. Like, I shouldn't shouldn't even be here. But then uh, I was looking and then didn't rig myself for a couple of days, I think, because it was too windy. I, I saw the finals. I was like, whoa, I never seen jumps anywhere near that height and never seen a wind like that. And then a couple of days later, when the wind finally dropped and the waves got smaller and the guys were actually freestyling, I rigged my 3-0 and I went for, for a couple of runs. And came back in, and then it's like, okay. I did pose okay, good. Those jumps were big, though. I think even even now, maybe except for the landings or the style or whatever. But you know, the stall doubles Vidar was doing, or the back loops uh, Jonas was yeah. doing at the time. I think even now, the Jonas were... was sailing. Jonas looked unbeatable. Uh, I thought that for sure he was going to win the event. Watching his eats, I remember. Big back loops, but one thing that I remember the most was the tabletops that he was doing. He was doing some tabletops that were crazy. They were not super high, but I think they were the most sweet I've seen up until this day. Him and Dario, Dario was doing them. Like I think he 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 even went with the with with one hand to the other side of the boom sometimes, right? He went so tweaked. I don't remember, but he, it looked like he was almost had his back on the other side of the sail. It yeah, was it was so insane. Tweaked. Insane. Yeah. It was impressive. Yeah, I wish we had uh, more more footage and more live stream and stuff from, from back then. But anyway, yeah. yeah, me as a kid, I was watching that and it was, yeah, it was insane. But um, let's talk a little bit about Kauli. Obviously, he kind of dragged you into that. And how you said he fully supported you. He kind of dragged you into that. But he wasn't, what was he like at the time, like 20? 21 or something it's not like he was yeah he was maybe like that maybe that age but but Kali was always so focused you know um, Kali was one of the guys that I met that spent the most amount of time in the water and he was sailing so much man like he was sailing a ridiculous amount of time like he in Maui looked like he was plugged into a battery like had so much energy and and because he was the only person that I was around. That's what I thought everybody did. And later on, I came to find out that people didn't train that much, you know? And, and that was, now I see how fortunate I was to be around that, to be watching him training at the time. I remember in Maui, like, he would just sail the whole day, pretty much every day. Got to keep 11 in the morning with food. We had food in the car. I couldn't sail as much as he did at the time. He sailed all day long. And then he also did not have that condition thing. A lot of a lot of the time I hear a lot of guys going, oh, the conditions are this, the conditions are that. Let's wait for the conditions. Kali was like, man, we're here at the beach. We're going to rig. We're going to sail. It doesn't matter what it is. At his home, he'd be like, he like you'd be sailing a lot of the times with current, with no wind at all. So it was really crazy to be around Kali at that time because he was he was the front runner I think pushing wave sailing in those years it definitely rubbed off on you though because I I remember coming to Maui last year and there would be many days where like you say people were sitting on the rail and ah, I don't know this and that and I was there rigged kind of not wanting to go alone but then you would just come rig and go you know and I would be like stoked like uh, you just yeah I guess uh 20 or yeah almost 20 years later it's still still there that same you know what it is for me i hate the feeling of loading my truck going to the beach and coming back home without getting in the water you know I yeah really once you're there like, you want to stay there like once i'm there i want to at least get tired you know at least get in the water whatever get a few waves get pounded but at least come home with that feeling of being tired, like you can relax and you can move on to something else because otherwise you have all that energy, you go there and what do you do? 
more like get pounded, more like throw a couple air tacas and a couple of 360s and like sometimes, sometimes I don't throw, sure. throw a really long swim to pull out too and <laughs> yeah <laughs> like side really side on shore 10 knots must high I remember one day I think like yeah you almost landed that's on how the they always run the aloha that's how the conditions we always get so yeah, it's good there to you go. that, right? yeah but anyway so Kauli definitely rubbed off on you but how did your parents feel about sending like a 13 year old kid 14 year old kid with a 20 year old into basically the other side of the world right yes i still have to talk with them about that i don't know but now that i have a kid i find myself thinking about that a lot like wow like how did they allow all of that to happen so early but my dad was my dad is a really open-minded guy and he windsurfs his whole life like you said and he, and he knew that if he stopped those years from happening those trips you know it, it might have a negative effect on 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 he saw that Kali was on the right track and he knew that I would progress the most if I was around that energy so I think he just made the decision to and Kali man Kali was somebody he really trusted you know Kauli wasn't the kind of guy that was out partying. Kauli was all about sleeping early, training, saving a lot. It was fun. He wasn't super serious, like military or anything like that. He was a super fun making jokes all the time, but he was not crazy. He was the responsible, you know. I guess I guess that's what I was about to ask you. Like if if somebody comes, like a 19 or 20 year old comes and he's like, hey, I'm gonna take Kyle on tour, you know, I'm just gonna take him around the world. No worries, no biggie, you know. We're going to go to Fuerte, there's, yeah. a, there's a tent with 2,000 people yeah. partying, you know, like horny girls from all over the world, you know, and yeah, no biggie, all right? Yeah, <laughs> what, what would you say? <laughs> Kalika, I think, I think, you really, I think you really have to know the person who is taking him, and, and, and my dad knew Kali from when Kali was a kid, you know, and, and he knew that Kali would go to a party to celebrate a good result, but he wouldn't go anywhere with the purpose of partying, you know? He would go there to sail as much as he could, and if he got a good result by the end of the event, or one of his friends got a good result, then maybe celebrate, but Kauli was not a, the, the kind of person that was about partying. He was about, he wanted to get his world titles, and I think my dad knew that, you know, and he, but still, man, it's a hard decision because not even anything to do with that, but just sailing alone in those conditions, accidents, you know, in airports, all that kind of stuff. But I think you can't control everything, right? You got to let your kids do what they do. And, and I think... But that's, yeah, that's, I think that's great. I think that's one of the reasons why, why you are where you are, right? Because your parents allowed you to even make your mistakes, you know, and, and, and you're, you mature so much faster that way, right? When you're out there, you need to, you know, you need to even, even stuff that seems simple, check in, load your gear, yeah. you know, be on yeah. time, all these kind of things, you know, check into the hotel, all yeah. these things that, that seem small, but, you know, at first it's like, not, it's like. It's scary when you are 14, 15, all of those things. Well, different languages, you know, but it's nice that you start, you learn how to do it alone from an early age. It gives you uh, independence, you know, like uh, you, you can go wherever you want when you want it. And it's, it's a nice feeling when you're young. Yeah. How was, how was the tour back then? What do you remember from that event? Because I think it's, it's a very different, well, it just, yeah, it was what? 17 years ago so a lot of stuff changed yeah. my first memories from from the tour was before i even joined it was in 90, whoop, 98 99 when they had the the events in beach park in fortaleza and i remember i don't know if it's because i was too young but i remember it being really intense i remember just the just the brazilian national events were intense there was a lot of people there were guys who made a living just from competing on the on the Brazilian nationals. So when there is maybe more money like that and more attention, there was also crazy amount of testing, guys getting there with so many boards and 
a lot of heated moments, you know, on the start lines. I remember some discussions on the beach and and maybe it, more tense, more stress because maybe there was more pressure. I don't know. Uh, but I, I remember I remember more of that, you know, more just people taking it really and people still take it super serious now, but back then it was it, it just felt more intense to me. I maybe think there's less right now there's less discussing, less F you or less whatever, you know, getting into somebody's face or yeah whatever that's what i feel because that's what i grew up watching and then i got on tour and i was like this and everybody thought i was a total dick you know <laughs> so <laughs> so i thought you know you watch these other sports as well you know uh, whatever basketball i know you're not a big sports guy or whatever but and maybe maybe before this slalom didn't have as many rules right as they have now uh for i don't know if they did no, it's the opposite, actually. They used to have racing they rules. They had more rules. They had more rules, but because of that, you would get into the protest room, and that's where all the discussion started, you know? Now, yeah. you get you kind of cross the finish line, somebody took you out, and you're like, okay, I can either totally go off on this guy and punch him or whatever and get fined, or, and actually have my whole day being super emotional because, as you know, it doesn't go away super fast, you know? You need time to for the emotion to disappear or you can take yeah. a few deep breaths and just focus on the next one you know yeah but yeah anyway so fuerte is one thing but then you get to places like austria silt how was that for a guy that lived in brazil traveled to maui i guess that was your only destination right as a kid like yeah Going to it was man that that for me was one of the biggest 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 challenges i had i think my first contest in cold water was in Guincho in portugal <laughs> and <laughs> in june <laughs> and like 25 degrees air and maybe yes degree just water. a little bit cold water yeah and then maybe maybe guys wearing three shoes and white suits like that and i remember being so man like jumping in the water being like my God, this is so cold. And then I, I remember I used to talk about that to everybody. I go in the beach to all the sailors, guys from England or for Ireland or whatever, like, hey, cold water here. How do you guys deal with this? And everybody's looking at me like they <laughs> didn't even guy? understand what I was saying. But it was cold to me. And then the next one was Austria. And I remember being more nervous about getting in the water because of the cold. And that was a cold year too. I think it was two thousand and six, maybe. It was cold. It was. It was uh, even people that were saying it was cold. But I think my hands and feet froze, and I got that numbness. But I think the adrenaline of the event helped it. But that for me, for years, was a challenge. You know, to to face that. I have to say, I think anybody that free sails in cold thinks that it's maybe not so bad but competing is just so different isn't it i i still struggle yeah. to this day to, to really you know get to that the level that you really want for competition you know in the yeah. cold i can free sail for hours in five mil boots and gloves and whatever but competing yeah. is a whole different story do you still do you still have that or i have more of it depends uh if you if if it's gonna be a day that it's the end of the day and, and it's the first round, so maybe you know you're only gonna do one round that day, then it's not so bad. I feel like you gotta warm up and then you can feel good to do one heat or two heats. But the hard thing for me is where you are in the maybe in a double elimination and you go and you go on, and you're gonna have to do a lot of heats. Hopefully, if you keep making them, but when you start making the heats. Usually those cold places are places that there are short breaks, like say silk, for example. And as much energy as you spend on your heats, you spend to get your gear in a beach, to get your gear out of the short break and back on the launch place out of the out of the current. So it becomes a marathon on the sense that you own the wetsuit the whole day. After the first or second round, there is not really time to change. So that's where it get, gets exhausting. It's managing that 
energy spent of running around after your gear, bringing gear up, heavy energy for the heats, having the right amount of food, too much food, you don't feel good, too little food, then you get cold and weak. So I think that's the, that's where it gets hard. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, but then talking about Silt and Austria, anybody that's been there know that it's as much of an event as much as it is what's around the event, right? All the side events, all the parties, all that stuff. When, what was your first kind of experience with that? Because I don't believe that the guys just left the kid in the house because that's not how it works usually. It's more like... Oh, yeah, I mean, for sure, when you're 18, we all went to the American bar and partied and had beers. But for me, it was never before. It was always one time after the event or maybe like there was years that I maybe went a bit more and there was snowing that all in the forecast. But I don't think that's, that's never, it was never about that for us. For sure, no, I just wanted to, I wanted to see like how, how for, for a kid from Brazil, you know, kind of, Living in Man, people party a lot in Brazil too. No, it's I know, like, but it, it's different, isn't it? It's all yeah, kind yeah. of on the beach, you know, salsa, you know, kind of yeah. South American music. And here you get to, you know, you get to the American bar, there's sweat dripping off the ceiling. There's guys with no shirt yeah. diving from the bar into the crowd and all this kind of wild stuff, you know, there's these Germans, 40. 40 plus year old that they're going as wild as anybody, you know, and that, I don't know for me, yeah, if, sure. I, if I wasn't from Poland, it would be a total shock. And I seen guys yeah. that come to Poland when we had the big formula events and they couldn't believe, you know, and, and yeah. I guess Germany was, was the same. So that, that was more my question, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy to have an event in a, in a destination like Zilp that it's like a, a more city, you know, like it's a tourist place for all the, all the German people. They go there on vacation and then you have a windsurfing event in the middle of it. And there's so many people there that sometimes you, you're walking down the beach and you're a couple minutes away from your heat and, you, and you're like, man, how am I going to get my, my rig through all these people? And you like <laughs> try not to hit people's heads and it's crazy over there. Yeah, so I guess your first year, full year on tour in both disciplines was 06, right? 2006. And then on the results, I was shocked when I, when I did that research. You finished 10th in waves and 7th in freestyle in kind of your first full year on tour. And you won the Belgium jump indoor, yeah. the, the, the jumping in the in the Belgium indoor. How was that? Was it like, was it like kind of the analytical Brauzinho that we just saw explaining all these things, these little details, or you were just still like happy go lucky fully? Didn't even know. Uh, no, it was so different. I didn't, I didn't know what my stance was on my boards. I just kind of rigged things as they went and it was completely different. Um, just, that Belgian one was a big shock for me. Didn't expect it at all. And on waves, I think I went to the events with one, maybe two boards. It was very, very different for me. How, how many guys do you think know their stance in, in exact numbers right now on tour? Because for you, it's like, I didn't on even tour, know my know. stance. I mean... No, on, on tour, I think most, most guys will, will know for sure. But... I think uh, most free sailors probably just kind of fill it out as they get aboard and slowly they adjust it. But I maybe I don't think everybody knows the actual number. Yeah, because you said it like it was the most basic. Like it was if which you're, if you're a professional windsurfer, uh, that's that's something you, you should know probably. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so from there, from seventh in freestyle and ten in waves. It took you only a year to win a world title in freestyle. And then it took you another seven to win in waves. Why, why do you think, why do you think 
freestyle is always this kind of you know younger discipline where all the kids come and they can do good straight away whereas the waves it takes a lot more time i think freestyle uh maybe there is less variables when you are competing uh, when you're doing a run it's always kind of choppy but then you can train in choppy places and then it's wind is strong or it's light but the wind being port tech or starboard tech is not going to ruin your life you can adjust yourself you know you can you can still do the moves on both decks in waves i think there is a lot more variables first of all starboard and port that's the biggest one for me it took a really long time i think because i didn't really start training on port tech until my 20s i had sessions before but i was too busy with training freestyle that I would never go on a trip or, or put time apart to train on Port Tech. And it was only in 2010 when I stopped competing freestyle that I said, okay, I'm gonna start doing Port Tech now. And then that year I went to Cape Town, I went to Chile, I went to Pozo a month and a half earlier and I stayed a month after the event. And, and I did that for three or four years or five years. And, and then I think only in 2012, and then you learn about your gear, and then not only Portek, but then all this current that you face in Zild, and, and all this, I think there is more variables. Like in freestyle, you have the current in Zild too, but usually when you're freestyling, the waves are smaller, and you're sailing out the back, but there's not that much current. So, you know, there is all this experience that it was hard for me because I didn't grow up sailing in Europe, I was sailing mostly in Brazil, where the conditions are pretty much the same every day, and in Maui, which they are not the same, they are big waves, but it doesn't have that aspect of places where it's really hard to get plenty in those things. So I think in waves, it takes longer because of that. Yeah. So your world champion year in freestyle, you start with a decent event in Lanzarote, and then you win Fuerte. And once you won in Fuerte. Did you know straight away, like, okay, this is the year. Now I just put all my energy into trying to win that. Or did you just... Not at all. Not at all. I remember after that event, I was so just happy that I won, but I wasn't thinking about the world title. I didn't even know. I knew I was on the top somewhere, but I didn't even believe it so much. And I remember, I remember being in Brazil for the Ibiraquera event. And I remember staying there extra after the adventure sale because it was good. And I remember Paskowski telling me at the time, like, man, if I was in your position, I would have not even gone to that event. And just trained I would have now. Stayed, stayed in Fortaleza training freestyle the whole time. And at the time, I looked at him and I, I didn't even process. I didn't even think of it that way. Until years later, I, I remember that. I thought, yeah, maybe he was right. Maybe that's what I should have done. But... At the same time, the fact that I didn't do that and didn't put that pressure on myself and didn't even think about the world title, maybe that made it happen at the time, you know? You know I was just feeling really relaxed with the whole thing. It wasn't a weight or... Even in Zilt, during the single elimination, I, I think we finished a single and then after the single, maybe I was second or third. And then I remember Kali, man, man, you must be pissed, maybe one more heat and you'd have been first or something like that. And I was like, but man, I'm second or third. Next year, last year I was seventh. You know, I'm happy. Yeah. And then the double came and then I, Nick Baker was there helping me and he, he got me on a good mindset and then it, and then it happened. But I think it's, it's the two things. It's good to train hard, but it's also good to be uh, relaxed and enjoying it. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot more even than two things, but yeah. Uh, so take us take us through that heat because I just saw the the El Yaque movie where it's shown really well how you and Ricardo you had this heat that if you won you would become world champion and that heat was on hold for I don't know forever like through Zil 
against yeah. Ricardo? Yeah. Was it against him? Yeah, it was. That's what it says in the movie, at least. <laughs> uh, I don't think. Maybe it was. I think I, it was the starboard tack day, right? Yeah, starboard tack, side offshore, light, and they would run the heat, cancel it. You guys would go in the water for 30 seconds. They would cancel rain squall, whatever. Oh yes, yeah. so and then I, yeah, and then it ended up in the in the in the late in that late the day. I remember we were both kind of cramping and and I didn't I didn't remember that was against Ricardo. I thought it was with Paskowski for some, but maybe Paskowski was around before. Yeah, I just remember being super tired, but I remember Nick Baker was at the beach. And he was helping me out a lot. He was bringing me water and keeping my gear on the right place and, and making sure I had a jacket on, you know. So he gave me a lot of, a lot of instructions that day for the, for the code. And I, I yeah, I, 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 was, I, had a, I had a couple of good heats that, that event. And it was good because it was starboard tech. So it kind of helped me a little bit, I think, because of the air chachus. And a couple of trip jumps that I did better on that deck. But yeah, I don't remember that much. So yeah. long ago. I think there's a classic photo where they chair you up the beach and it's just fully dark. It's like pitch black. The, the yeah, I think I think I when I won that heat, I didn't know that I was first, but then JC told me. JC came to take the picture and then he said, Yeah, oh, you're first, you're first. And then and then it was really small chance that we would do the double if the another because you could do many singles or doubles. And then I remember I was celebrating because I thought I won because JC was saying that or maybe someone else. And then I remember Nick Baker saying, man, you didn't, it's not over yet. Stop celebrating. Don't, it's not finished. It's not finished. And then, man, then I kind of, and then I kind of calmed down, but I was still really happy. And then, uh, uh -huh. and then we had to finish the double the next day. And I think there was Kiri and Goito ahead. And then, when that double finished, I, maybe the wind died or something, and that wasn't enough time to do another one. So JC spoiling the, sending a big spoiler. JC is obviously uh, <laughs> John Carter, the official photographer of PW yeah. for many, many years now. So I, I jumped the timeline a little bit because actually before you won your title, you had a feature movie come out, committed, which I think for many people, it was kind of the, your kind of arrival because back then it was not what it is now with following the contests and live streams and social media. Of course, all of that was around a little bit, but not to the point where it's today. I even tried to find some pictures from that Belgium indoor and there's like maybe 20 pictures online, you know, it's not, it's not the same. So putting out a full length, a full-length movie was well first of all an arrival on the scene but second of all it must have been a dream for a guy that watches or watched at that time basically all the movies on on repeat how, how, how did that came about yeah. it was strange it was so different because now we film and we see the footage each day like those those days we were lucky if we saw the footage before the movie because I remember Peter Svensson was doing it. And we, I don't think we had a plan to do that movie. But then I was in Jerry uh, sailing. Because I was always at sailing at that time. And Peter was there on vacation. And we started filming it. And I think along the way, we kind of decided to, to do the movie. And, but it was, they were filming every day. But I, I don't think I got to see many of the shots until the, the movie was done. So that's how you see how different it was at the time yeah. and then and then I, I didn't think much of that movie i mean before i didn't think and then it was it went well that had good exposure and then we did another one of peter the committed reloaded one and that one we put a lot more energy and, and planning and trips and i was more involved with the selection of the shots and all of that but um that the, the second one was the one that i i felt like i worked more the first one, I was just going sailing there, like yeah. I did, and then he was filming. But the, the second one, we play in more. Yeah, sailing, I, I kind of rewatched that, actually. And sailing, well, you were, what, like 
16 or something at that time, 17 maybe. And I mean, it's, it's insane how like you're jumping at that time already, like doubles clean. Okay. Obviously that's on starboard tack, which is your, by far your favorite was your favorite tack at that time. Right. But, um, what, what, what age did you land your first double? I think I tried, I spun a couple when I was early 14. I think I spun a couple and I probably landed some late that year. For, so 14, 15, yeah. 14, 15, something like that. You obviously later on kind of focused on the waves, but why do you think it is that so many of world champions or top, top guys were doing freestyle either simultaneously with the waves or, you know, or even exclusively like, like Ricardo, you know, Kauli was doing freestyle, was on the podium. Even Toma Traversa, that year that you won, he was in a shot of a world title. I don't think many people know that. Even Victor, you know, Victor was doing freestyle. Do I think, think it's, it's a combination of things. I think the, the main thing is where you live. Ricardo lived in El Yaque, so it doesn't get better for freestyle than that place. Yeah. I lived in Brazil, you know, like flat water. So for kids, it's really accessible. You don't need anybody. I mean, some places you do, but for me, I didn't need anybody to drive me to the beach. I could do it on my own time. And every day there was something new. You always, you go online and you see, oh, somebody did this, somebody did that. And it was, it was so exciting to every month have a new trip, you know? And I think for kids, um, that excitement of having something new to work on, it's, it's the best thing. And, and it was also a, a easier way for the younger generation to get exposure at the time for sponsors and things like that. And it would, it would be hard to, at that time beat the top guys on waves because they were so much more experienced but on freestyle the young guys had so much more energy to stay repeating that same trick a thousand times get you know, pounded eat shit yeah maybe you don't have that patience when you're a bit older so i think for that reason maybe the freestyle guys got good when they were so young and um and 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 i think that was the first discipline where they really took over yeah, and, but do you think I, it? Do you think it 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 helped like these guys tremendously, or is more like they did freestyle, they came onto the scene, and then they had the possibility to do waves, or you, not they, because you're part I think, of. It. I think it helps. I think it helps because when you when you're learning so many tricks, you 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 like you. I don't know, twist your ankle and then you come back a month later and you're like, oh, there's three tricks I got to learn, or four tricks I got to learn. And when you're doing freestyle, that doesn't seem like a, like a, a crazy thing because you, you learn so many tricks, so you're going to go and learn them. But when you stop and you're only wave sailing and there's a new trick and you're like, whoa, there's a new trick. How are we going to do to learn that? You know, it, it seems like a lot more to learn a new trick when you stop freestyling because mostly what you do is repeat and perfect but you already know. So I think in that sense, yeah. freestylers, when they came to wave sailing, they had to learn new things. It wasn't that mental, you know, block. Like, oh, you learn it. You, you learn it. It's easy. You know how to learn, you know? Yeah. I think. Then you touched already on Committed Reloaded, which at that time was, I think, one of the best movies out there. I mean, still, I couldn't actually find it preparing for this, but... I remember watching it. I watched it so many times. I can like, I have like screenshot. I know which music there was and everything. And this was kind of the first movie that really talked about and showed bringing that freestyle into the waves and you doing air taka after air taka after air taka and you know all these kind of like you say you know before maybe it was some sort of a gimmick but now all of a sudden it was a move that you could incorporate into proper wave riding and it would look cool and you know the older guys that maybe wouldn't want to learn it you know you had an advantage straight away so how did the movie came about and how 
like was it natural for you to just try these kind of more freestyle orientated moves in the waves or i don't know <laughs> it was natural because at that time i was still doing a lot of freestyle i was still competing and and a lot of the tricks were got punch got going on flat water and then yeah. we were doing so many of those goiters on freestyle because you were doing goiter into flaca got into this got into that so it was so easy for us at the time to do it on flat water. Then for the goiters and the air attack, because all you got to do is kind of change the angle of which the sail spins. So for me, it was the most natural thing to kind of go eyeing the wave and, and trying to put that, but trying to put that on the most critical part of the wave I could find. And, and that was natural I think, coming from freestyle because we were doing a lot of that movement. Oh, look who it is here. Come to say hi. That would be Kayo, I guess. Oi! <laughs> Bom dia! The slalom body. <laughs> He's <laughs> huge, isn't he? Jeez, yeah. Look at him. Oh, sorry, I'll be back. <laughs> That's amazing. We'll get, we'll get to that, being a new daddy. Yeah. So cool. Um, but also, I remember, and this is my friends and we, we laughed about this a lot. I remember this quote. Um, first of all, you say like, I love freestyle and I want to keep doing for many more years. <laughs> and then you, I don't know, after a year or something, you quit. Obviously, that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't entirely up to you, I guess, with the injuries and stuff. But how did that process of, you know, just focusing on the waves come about? It happened when I when I broke my foot because when you when you I was before just sailing every day and I was not really thinking much far ahead of what I wanted to do. And then in the beginning of the year when I was in Cape Town in 2010, I broke my foot. And then that you know two three months it gives you a lot of time to think. And then I I realized that I really wanted to spend more and more time wave sailing because that's what I thought what I thought about the most and where my I think I wanted it more to be around waves and I had been on that year having more fun doing wave events even when I had bad results so it's not that I didn't like freestyle but I, I was so much more interested in waves in watching footage of wave sailors that I thought I want to do that and there is no point on trying to do two things because then I'm always going to be on disadvantage of one thing if I'm freestyling and wave sailing, I'm never going to have the time to learn Cortex, which is something I really wanted to, to do. And I was really paying the price on that because in Pozo, I could never have that break and time to focus on training because we had Lanzarote, we had this, we had that, I had to prepare. And I just started feeling a little bit overwhelmed with doing two disciplines. I felt like it would be really hard to get a wave title if I was still focusing on freestyle. And I didn't want to do freestyle without putting the energy and just going to the events without practice. That's not something that was in my interest to do. Have you not won the, a world title in freestyle? You think you'd keep doing it, trying to win one, or would you switch to the waves as well anyway? I don't know, man. That's so hard to say. Uh, I don't. I think I'd have switched to waves also because it's what I like the most. And in the end of the day, do what you like. And the second quote from that movie is like, moving to Mistral was such a big step for me. It's amazing. Working with Nick Baker, Mark Nelson. I want to stay here forever. And that movie dropped in like September, October, whatever. And then in January, you, you announced you're going with... Uh, North fanatic. So, so what was that all about? But that wasn't my decision at the time. At that time, Mistral closed. You know, yeah. they had uh, they had financial financial problems and they had financial things going on, and they couldn't keep that team anymore. So I was kind of fanatic was on board and more at the time, and it was what made sense for me at the time. But it wasn't like a, a decision. You know, it was it was just how things evolved. It wasn't me. You know, it was it was the brand at the time. 
I guess you're still the last world champion on Mistral, huh? <laughs> Pretty. <laughs> yeah, am I? I guess, yeah. yeah. Must be. Yeah. So then you guys did uh, Four Dimensions and Minds Wide Open. And I think these are, these were pretty, I mean, pretty big projects for the financial situation of the industry and sort of also with moving away from, from, you know, filming for big projects, but going to social media that was happening already in YouTube and all that. First of all, it must have felt good. And second of all, do you still watch them? And were you happy how, how they came out? Because I remember some discussions overhearing some stuff like, ah, you didn't put this. Yeah, but the light was bad. And, you know, like the filming guys versus the, the windsurfers. You know, I don't know if it was you or Ricardo or, you know, like pulling a sick move, but I don't know, the lighting or the colors or whatever wasn't right and they wouldn't put it in. The, the movies, those movies for me, they were a really big priority on my ear. I was, they were as important as getting good results because I, I always had a passion for movies. As a kid, I knew every single movie, every single trick. So I took the time and I really put a lot of energy into trying to get good sections and there always comes that stress because that's, for me, I couldn't care less about the light, about that stuff. I just, I wanted good music and I want the best tricks to be in there. And the, the guys, the producers, obviously, with much more knowledge and experience than me, wanted the, the shots that looked better overall. So then we would sometimes have little heated arguments. And, uh, little or heated? But not, huh? <laughs> little or heated? Heated, when you, yeah, I mean, we were all working really hard on it and we all wanted our vision to, to go forward and everybody was a lot younger, so you didn't calculate your words as much. But, <laughs> yeah. So growing up watching all these things, what, what were your favorite, or what are your favorite until today, what, favorite windsurfing movies? Favorite of all time, I have to say, about time from Polakow. Same, same. Yeah, that's my favorite movie. Um, and then I like a lot the windsurf movies one and two. I think they're really good. Obviously, I like Minds Wide Open, but it's yeah, it's. I didn't watch as many times the movies that, that I was on as I watched the other movies, but. Rip, uh, Robin Nash, Robin Nash is one. And the first Polk Hour movie before, the one before About Time. Unleashed was good. The Force was good. Plug and Play was good. But those are not, those were the other ones, like the, the primary ones were the ones that sent first. And if you have to pick one that you're in? Mine's wide open, I think, was the best one. So do you think in this era of, you know, YouTube, Instagram edits, you're basically posting probably one sailing edit every week or something. Do you think it's still possible to make a film, to make a proper windsurfing movie that we kind of grew up on? I, I really like movies. I like those long movies where you watch it on a big screen screen and you can see all the work and all the the quality and the angles and all of that as now now I appreciate that a lot more than I did when I was doing minds wide open and, and, and those it's kind of strange now I know a lot of people already said that but all these video producers and people have really expensive camera gear and everything and in the end people are watching the stuff on their phones on a screen that big and it really changed, you know, I think it became much more about the, the vlogs and what people are doing every day and session here and that than a really well produced thing. So I like both, but I think it's really nice when you look forward a really long time to see a project that someone has been doing that you know you've heard that they scored a really good trip here, they scored a really good trip there, and then you don't know what you're going to get and you're really excited to see that movie and when it comes to your hands, finally you can watch it. I really like that feeling. And that's yeah, you go to the cinema, watch. you know, you go to the cinema, you sit down, guys are yeah, there. You take the time to watch. 
yeah. you're not watching the line of somewhere on your phone and then you kind of have saw it, but then, you know, it kind of takes it away from it a little bit. And you can't, you can't go frame by frame on Instagram. You can't stop it. It's like... I know, frame by frame was good, huh? Like, I love doing <laughs> the frame by frame thing. We'll get to that. We'll get to My brother got really pissed off because we used to watch the movies with the remote going frame by frame and he's like, man, just let the thing play. I'm like, no, no, wait. <laughs> you film, I mean, you film pretty much every day. Do you, do you ever go sailing without a camera anymore? Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I go sailing a lot without a camera. When I'm sailing down the coast, jumping, a lot of the times I, I just go sailing and then when the conditions are good and it's sunny and it's nice, we film. And that happens a lot in Maui, so you happen to film a lot, but there's also a lot of sessions that are not filmed. I guess that's where, that's where we could say you are competitive, right? And that kind of against yourself, against yourself. No, I, I, I am definitely competitive. I am definitely competitive. I like to, to learn tricks. I like to improve my sailing. I'm just not so much, if I'm free sailing, I, I, I'm not thinking, oh, I want to sail better than that person. You know, that's for me. It's like, oh, I want to do this trick. I want to do a turn like this. I want to do this like that. I'm a, I'm more competitive on that way than the other. Way. Obviously, if somebody's smoking you on the water, you you get a little bit. Oh, I want to still better, you know. But yeah. not just about that. Yeah, that doesn't happen very much in Hokipa, I think. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie Swift gave. A certain activity you do pretty much every night, a name. Tipping? Yeah. <laughs> what is. It's funny that he says that. It's funny that he says that because he does just as much, if not more. Uh, do you watch? Because the story has it. The first thing I saw was Swift showing me his phone, and you could see you just your face lit with the laptop screen going like like this frame by frame then going back then watching like kind of on a different angle <laughs> <laughs> then going again how often Can't do you deny do that? that one huh that that's how i that's how i try to learn stuff uh, i do that Depends. It depends. When I'm in Pozo the month before the event, I do that a lot. Uh, now, not doing it as much because I haven't been filming much. But it's more like when you when you want to learn a new trick, you want to make sure that you see everything. You want to see your hands on the boom. You want to see your stance, your legs, everything. So I think for me that's training in a way. And I do I, I do a lot of that, especially when I'm before an event, you know, like trying to, trying to learn stuff. Oh, thank you. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so you do those two movies with uh, North Fanatic, and it seems like you're at, from the outside. It seems like you know you're at home, and you've been with Boards and More for that Mistral time as well, and whatever. And then you move on to Goya, which I think for many people from the outside wasn't like super obvious, and. I want to ask you because it seems like you know that there was a time where you would change sponsors quite frequently but since you went to Goya you've been there for like I don't know nine years now or something eight years yeah nearly what do you think what do you think makes a good sponsor competitor relation sponsor rider relation except for the money which there was a rumor that was a part of it as well. I mean, it's always a part of it, obviously. But yeah, what do you think? What do you think makes that? Um, I think it's a lot of things. With Goya, it was a good fit because obviously they gave me a good proposal. We lived on the same place. It was easy to work with gear, develop things. I got along really well with everyone on the brand, you know, like. They were, they were friends before we started working together. And more than anything, they always gave me a lot of freedom to travel where I want to travel, not to put me on too many trips of things that I didn't want to do. They never requested that of me. 
they're always kind of there to give me the tools and, and support and allow me to do what I wanted to do. And I think because of that, we always had a really good relationship. And because they gave me so much freedom, I always it was always very important to me to try to give back as much as I can, you know, in terms of, of exposure for them and testing and everything yeah. what I can do. So as opposed to them not making you go on trips that you didn't want to go, so before, I guess, there was some sort of direction that you were pushed in. What? No, I mean, I, I always had good relationship with the brands, but uh, sometimes, you know, you got to do a lot of promotions and, and things like that. that. They are nice, but for me, the, the main priority is always to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, good time of the year where there's more chances of getting a good swells, you know, good conditions. and. If you're doing a lot of promotions and a lot of trips where the dates are fixed, you end up missing out on a lot of things. And Goya always allowed me to make my own schedule. And that's something that I really, I'm really appreciative because I was able to score a lot of good conditions over the years. And that, that's what it's all about. In the end, no? Yeah, like Fiji this year. Uh, how was that? Last year, sorry. Yeah, that was amazing. Best, best condition, one of the best conditions I've ever seen in my life. Far. And I think, what what was uh, Jason saying about the footage and the trip and all that? Because before he kind of owned the place, he had a couple trips alone, ripping, you know, like, and then <laughs> you come along and I think some of the hits and some of the airs and some of the stuff you did there, I think nobody, including him, you know, kind of, I didn't really, uh, Jason, Jason, Jason still owns the place. Like he, he's such a machine. When we got there, he had everything organized. And the first view I had of him, it was like him doing yoga on the reception of the hotel because he had such a bad knee. He couldn't even walk in the morning. <laughs> like every day we woke up and he was like leaping to breakfast. I'm like, man, are you sure you're going to be okay to go sailing? And he's like, yeah, yeah let's do it. I'm going to do it anyway. It's going to be good. But I'm surprised that he even sailed because his knee was like really swollen and you know, he was limping the whole time that we were there. Like he had a really terrible knee and he still got some really good waves and rip and it was only one day of the swell and, and Jason was amazing. Like he organized the whole thing, hotels, filmers, everything and he was so fun to be around and he had he, he said he had way better swells there before. He's been there so much and hopefully I'll be able to line up to go there again with him soon. And you obviously scored really good jaws, which is not maybe yeah. so hard when you live about five minutes away, <laughs> or maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes. But I mean, the last edit you put out, I think it, it blew everybody's minds. You know, I, I, I don't think you just look comfortable. You just, you don't look different than Okipa. And is that because you actually feel comfortable with your gear, with how many times you sail the place, etc., or is just your mind that everybody goes there and they're like, "Oh, it's Jaws, it's, it's you know, it's a big wave." When you know, when I went, it wasn't actually that big, but still, it's Jaws and it has all this, and you go with the ski and you rig on the ski, and everything is so big and the cliff and all that you know it gets you really really anxious you feel really overwhelmed i did at least you know so so what do you think it is that 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 you just look so comfortable out there i think it's a it's a mix of everything i i feel like that too i still feel scared but i've been there so many times over the past 10 years that slowly you get more used to it you remember the mistakes and things you did on sessions before that you wish you changed and you do that over and over and over so many times. And this year was a really special year because we always get to sail there. But every time, every year there is something that makes it hard. Either the crowd, the wind is too offshore, the wind is too light, this, this and that, or the wind is only a couple hours of the day. This year we didn't have that many days, but we had four days that were fully windy for most of the day clear skies so steady winds and not that crowded 
from surface because they were the forecast had shown a lot of rain, so they didn't as many people didn't come, and the sailors were not here, so it was uncrowded. And with that, we had like so many waves. That alone helps double the, the performance of your session and you have so many waves and then you get one day and then you have again the next day so you're able to look at the footage that night and correct all those little mistakes tune up a couple of things and then go again the next day and then two weeks later you have another swell i think it was a combination of going there many times um, and a really good year because four days can can be very different you can have four average days where you get two, three set waves on a day, or you can have four days like we have this year where you really get a lot of waves. And I think it was mainly because this year the conditions were better than they had. That, and, and don't, like, I think nobody should get stuff wrong. That place is really hard to sail. Took me, <laughs> took me like an hour to even get a wave. Not because of the crowd or anything. Yeah, the crowd doesn't help, but it's just... It's just a difficult place to sail that requires a lot of, I think, experience out there, like you say, you know, the right lineups and and also, you know, the, that you actually need to catch the wave quite deep, right? You need to kind of be, not, as a, not like a surfer necessarily, but the, you know, the wave goes so fast that you need it to, to wall up to be able to actually catch it. So, so then you're obviously scared to get pounded and you have gotten pounded there. So, first of all, how is it? And second of all, is getting out of there kind of unscathed? Does that help, actually, you know? Yeah, I think, I think you, you have to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. I think I have not been involved on a white pile as bad as it can be over there at all. I maybe had five or six wipeouts there in my life, and I'm sure it can be a lot worse, but it's funny, sometimes you fall on a bigger wave and it's not as bad, and then sometimes you fall on a medium, smaller one, and it holds you for longer, so you you really have to respect the wave because you never know what's gonna happen, and you can never get to a place that you think, oh, I got this, I'll be okay no matter what if I fall, because you don't know that, you know, it's, it, can, it can be really bad even on a smaller wave, but what you can do is control the gear you choose, the sections you, you want to hit, and the place you want to be on the wave, and and make sure that if you do go there, that you've been training, that you've been active, and that you're feeling fit for yourself. Uh, you know, because that gives you extra confidence in your mind. At least you know you've done you've done that, so you are at your best shape. And um, but yes, it's it's always scary, man. Every time I'm there, I'm really scared. You know? Don't get me wrong, like the wipeout there, sometimes you see people having wipeouts and pulling into big barrels and it's like, oh, it's hard to even watch. So from Jaws, let's go to a little bit different conditions and location. Denmark, so your world title year, you don't start, this might be a theme because your freestyle world title, you didn't start the year super great. And then your wave sailing world title, you started with a fifth I guess and then you go to Denmark and in basically straight on shore 5-3 kind of the opposite of what people probably would think that you do well you win the event what do you remember from that event? And if that time winning that really put your mind into like, okay, I'm going to fucking win it this year. No. Every time I thought like that, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, not at all. I, I was just really relaxed on that event. We had a really nice week. We were not thinking about windsurfing at all. So we were really like enjoying the place going for runs mountain bike rides and and doing all of that and then out of a sudden the uh, forecast kind of came from nowhere so we didn't have much time to be stressed or do anything so it just kind of from a little vacation to rig up go let's start and then i was i had trained a lot 
before the event. I was in Maui and I sailed Waihu a lot that month. So my my own show was was you know I was well tuned up with my gear and everything because I I sailed at least 15 times that month of those similar kind of stuff. And that was kind of sometimes yeah those things start rolling. You know, sometimes you, you get on a rhythm and I was doing the tricks that I needed to do when I needed them, you know, and, and yeah, it was hard to, hard to pinpoint why it happened there or here, you know. It's like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so then you go to Maui and Philip seems to be in the driver's seat with a win in the Canaries and a second in Denmark. But he never... At that point, he never passed the heat in the Aloha Classic in Hawaii. So what's your expectation coming into that event, knowing that it is your backyard? There was more people in it for the title. There was Ricardo, there was Toma Traversa, there was Alex Mussolini. But I think a lot of people were picking you. Did you feel that? And what was your expectation? Um, I was hoping to do well, but also there was a lot of guys that could win the event. So I was, I was like, it's always, you, you don't, I don't know, maybe that's my negative side. I, I always think that it's going to be really hard and everything, but I just wanted to make sure that I could sail the way I can sail my best. And, uh, and the first heat on the single, I had a really good heat. And then the second heat, I had a shitty, terrible heat. I couldn't get away. I don't know. Sometimes we'll keep us like that. When you're pre-sailing, sometimes you have really good 15 minutes, and then you have really bad 45 minutes, and then you have another really good 20, 30 minutes. You know, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to say. Sometimes you just get bad waves, and they are sad waves, but the fact that they are sad waves that doesn't mean that they are good. Sometimes they are choppy, they are closing out. All you need is a chop out of place, you know? So keep is a tricky place. And, and when you fall, it takes you time to get back out. So it's all of those things that can really screw up a heat. And, and then I had a really bad heat on that second one. And I, I was devastated because I lost in the second round of that event when I had a shot at the title. I was like in tears and really upset. I came home and, and I was so upset. That I got so angry that I think I kind of forgot. I not forgot, but not gave up. I just kind of like whatever this thing. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. If not, not. I because that loss in the single elimination hurt me so much that when I went into the double, I was kind of like whatever, you know, just try what you can. And then it happened. Um, I made all my heats until Musso lost, and that's how it kind of happened. Throwing Eritaka after Eritaka after Eritaka, just... That was something that my brother said, actually, on the phone after the single. He's like, if you're going to lose, at least lose, like, falling and trying to do things that you know how to do. Don't lose just, like, being scared and not trying really hard, you know? Like, because that happens too. A lot of the time you try to stay safe and make a plan or, or try to ride a wave thinking of the points and that never worked for me every, every time I've done better is when I yeah at least go down swinging right from watching and from hearing and whatever you're totally into your gear right you want to have your gear at a hundred percent how much what percentage would you give the gear in wave sailing in terms of like let's say there's a cake at a hundred percent and you need to put your you know your mentality in there your gear your physical fitness all these things that how much would you say the gear is it's hard to say because they are not separate you know i think the gear is super important but it's really hard to have a strong mentality if your gear is not feeling so i think all of it connects and and the gear is super important in Zilt, if you don't have something that gets you off that short break, then you're not going to make it. In Maui, if you don't have a board that has good rails and it's forgiving and that allows you to go into the bottom turn, into a big wave, it's also going to make your life really hard. So I think the gear is super, 
very important. In Pozo, if you have a sail that doesn't handle strong winds, how are you going to control your jumps, you know? And I put a lot of lot of thinking and effort into try to develop the best gear that I can. But once again, once the contest starts, that's hopefully done. And, and you know, and, and knowing that you did that gives you extra confidence that knowing that you you trust your gear and you know it really well, it gives you extra confidence, I think, in weeks. So you so never all, think so you never think it it can bring you back like paying super attention to detail. Like I don't know, in slalom it can really af- affect your confidence if you go out there and you feel like okay, I could have two clicks more downhole, which is like six mil. No, I, I don't think wave saving goes that extreme. I don't think wave sailing that the attention to detail, at least for me, maybe for some other guys it is, but I don't think I pay as much attention as a salon guy at all. You know, I I I have my, my boards and I sales and, and if I get a good feeling from them, if I feel like I'm moving around in the lineup as much as the other guys and more and, and, and my sail feels light and responsive and, and you can trust your board going into a bottom turn, you know, like I don't measure how much down all I put on my sail. Yeah. I don't look at that like by the centimeter. You know, I kind of look at the sail, I bump, I, it's, it's more, I think, a little bit more feeling than, than as compared to slalom, where it's really millimetrically you know, precise. Yeah, because I remember watching a, a video from Pozo, like one of your fanatic years, and you said like, oh, that's, that's when I sailed Pozo with a 22-inch stance. Or something like this, and you were kind of pinpointing that to be, you know, to be a big thing that, you know, that brought you back, you know. At, at that but when I, when when I was in well, my early twenties, I didn't pay that much attention at all to gear. I knew I, I knew what I felt good, and I knew what what felt bad, but I didn't really know. I mean, I still don't know exactly why, but. Francisco was the person who opened my eyes to a lot of details that I didn't know before. Francisco was the guy that took me into the shaping room and started showing me, look, this is more you like because of this, this, and that. This this place you've been saving good on. This is... He was the person who did that because before that, I didn't pay that much attention to those details. I didn't, you know? And then he made, made me understand every board I get. I kind of... I have those basic measurements that I look at and, and that came mostly from Francisco, those things. Francisco Goya, that is, of course. And looking back at PWA is just dropping all these old movies right now, all these highlights. And I have to say that his, like I just watched the 99 one and his, his, his boards, they look super smooth. Like everything looks just so buttery, where some other guys you could see they're fighting a little bit, or uh, you know. So, so Francisco, uh, he really has a, a lot of sensitivity, and, and and he has a really good eye for detail in windsurfing. He sees things on boards that I never would have seen if he didn't show it to me, like little details on rails and things that. He can he can feel them really quickly. Things that sometimes takes me three or four or five days of testing to say, okay, this board is more like this. You you feel that in a couple of runs, you know. So it's really nice when he when he's on the island and we can go test gear together. Did you ever try one of these old boards? These old. I super think I'm too heavy. I think I'm too heavy for them. Francisco was on the full training yoga super. I don't know how he wrote like. Went to his house a couple of years ago and he pulled one of his boards and it looked like something that I had out sink it with one leg. <laughs> I don't know how he sells so good. Yeah. So, yeah, so looking back from these early days, Francisco, now to what you guys are doing and what you're doing, like how much it evolved is crazy with, with all the aerial moves and all the rotations and all that stuff that you guys just have on lock it seems like every edit has a move that back then would have been you know the sickest of like you would watch the whole movie for that move 
But where do you think, because I have to say, it does seem like everybody's doing these things better, faster, stronger, better style, more tweaked, etc., etc. But it seems like new moves are not coming along so much because there's only so much you can invent. So where do you think it's going? Where, what is the next big thing that, that is going to you know, really change the sport? Bigger, higher, faster. You know? If Triple. a new trick comes, great. If a, new, if a new trick comes, great. But I hope that the new tricks that come are not tricks that limit height and speed. Because you can tweak whatever hand, whatever this is, but if that is limiting height and speed, then it's not super progressive to me. Like the push forwards and the doubles and everything, you can do them high and clean as, as far as the conditions allow, you know, like to see guys doing them each time bigger and better. And that's why I like those tricks so much. So I hope that if new tricks come around, there are things like that that have no height limit on, I think, you know, in that sense. Just to wrap it up, you just, you're fully Maui based now. Uh, American wife, son is growing. That's one massive baby. <laughs> Do you expect him to, to go into slalom? Cause he's like, well, well, is he out of the scale yet? I don't know. Like <laughs> he has, he has. I'll tell you, he has solemn legs. He has definitely those thick uh, solemn legs, or he could do that, or he could have some really powerful turns too. Like he's a heavy, heavy baby for his for his age. <laughs> okay, so based in Maui, do you still get localized? As or you are you a local? Are you a local now? No, not at all. Not even close. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you still get shown, showed out sometimes from full howdy, yeah, full howdy. Okay, yeah. so when, so obviously you're like, as probably everybody knows by this interview, you're like fully into your windsurfing and super passionate and whatever, and and. Maybe outside of windsurfing and surfing, we didn't mention so many things because it's not like you do all that much different, do you? Maybe just hanging out with the family and stuff. Did you ever wonder like when you would like to slow down? Maybe, I'm not saying retire or whatever because you're obviously always going to be sailing, but did you, did, does that cross your mind yet at 30, 31? Not yet, not yet. I still really like the. I still really like preparing for events. I like the ner the nervous energy you have on the day of the contest. I still think I have a lot of. Um, hopefully, it's still a couple more good years on tour. And uh, yeah, whenever I feel like I'm probably not in contention or not getting the results I want to have. I'll stop, but so far I still feel really in love with with the whole the whole job that we have, the travels, the scoring good conditions, and doing the contest. So I still think I hope we have a lot of time. What are your pet peeves, and why is it sail numbers? <laughs> what do you mean? What the things I don't like? Yeah, the things that like drive you nuts on a but like almost subconsciously, like you you know you straight away get like almost a psych physiological reaction almost i don't know i don't think i have anything very specific that we, um, well you do hate do sale numbers I do, well, i'll tell you like i do it because it's necessary but I, grocery shopping is not one of my favorite things <laughs> I, I have a hard time with grocery shopping especially if i am hungry like if i went grocery shop it better be after a big meal <laughs> yeah when you're hungry it's terrible like I, I buy so much crap it's things you don't need yeah. yeah unbelievable okay how many times a day do you pee your wetsuit when it's cold especially? yeah my wetsuit depends is it in hilt in zilt doing a, a double elimination yes a lot of peeing um 
on Maui, if I'm just going for a session, I try not to pee at all. But if I have to pee, I don't come out of the water, get out of my wetsuit to do that either. So Nobody does that. You just lie about it. Yeah. So it's just always, I mean, it's just something I have to do. Guilty pleasure. Yeah. Well, well no, but what is, no, I'm not saying peeing is your guilty pleasure. I'm asking uh, what is your guilty pleasure. <laughs> it sounded like it was. <laughs> my, my guilty pleasure is probably desserts. I really enjoy eating desserts. Top five windsurfers of all time. Not in a sequence. I'm just going to put the top five, but there is no ranking. No particular there. order. Yeah. Um, Polakau, Kali, um, Levi, Francisco. There's room only for one more. Huh? Um, Ricardo. Okay, so no Bjorn, huh? You really don't care about these titles. No, Bjorn too, but I, I, I was more thinking wave sailing because of yeah. it's more of what I watch and what I do. Yeah, but yeah, for sure. I'm a, yeah, it's your I'm a, personal. I'm a big Bjorn. There's no, I'm a Bjorn fan as well. There's no, no bad answer there. Okay, so now most underrated windsurfer of all time. That doesn't get enough credit. Vidar Jensen. There you go. See Tarnas Vidar. Okay. If you have had to choose one spot, you, you have to sail every day for the rest of your life. What would it be? Hukipa. Okay. Not far away from that. Worst yeah. excess baggage bill. Man, the top five worst were always in Hamburg. And I think I had three times that they charged me over 2,000 euros and I really had no option of canceling flights or, or looking for a plan B because we had the Aloha Classic here just a couple, like a week after or something. So we just had to bite the bullet. But um, yeah, definitely have, have had some really hard times in Hamburg Airport. Um, who's the best cook on tour? Best cook on tour. Hard to say because I always kind of hang out with Swift. Um, he's not that great of a cook um, <laughs> at all. I don't know. I think people cook really bad on Twitch, to be honest. Like Ricardo can only do this salmon plate that he always does. Swift. And he claims he's an amazing cook as well. Yeah. And, and last but not least, who do you want to hear on the podcast? Yeah. I want to see your podcast. I want to do one where I interview you. Okay, we can do that. No worries, but you're yeah. going to have to prepare, you know? Yeah, okay. You would have to watch all my, all my videos. <laughs> Is that something you rap you're now? to do? You into, you, you're doing rap now? I did um, for charity. I did. Ah, okay. But see, I, have some, I have some songs, but they're still... You should edit with the podcast, like an intro or... A... <laughs> Yeah, maybe just use one of the beats, but yeah, contemplating whether I should release it or not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, bro, for your time. Thank Great you, talk. Mike. A lot of insight, technical insight. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for organizing this. Have a good one there. Hope you score some sailing this week. Thank you. You too. You will actually. Okay. okay. Bye. Take okay. care. Bye. Take care. And there you go. That was it. Marsilio Brown in all his glory. How long before he wins another world title? Surely. He's due. He's due. Uh, give us a thumbs up like if you made it all the way to the end. Uh, let us know in the comments who else you'd like to hear on the podcast. We've had some pretty, uh, pretty inter interesting ones recorded recently. So they'll be coming up in future weeks. Remember, every Wednesday will be a podcast. Uh, depending how they go down, maybe we'll go bi-weekly. But at the moment, we're going weekly. And we've got plenty more, like I say, where that came from. Uh, don't forget to share it. Tell your friends about it. Uh, 
uh, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss another episode. We've also got lots more coming up on the channel, a bit of winging action, a bit of idiot's guide to speed sailing, um, and obviously send it Sunday. Um, are we going back to Poser for the training diaries? Who knows? Who knows? Click on the other episodes up there if you missed them. And uh, thanks for watching or listening.